Hey everybody, welcome to the Linux Cast. I'm your host, Matthew Weber. I'm joined by Martin Burke. How you doing, Martin? Yeah, well, Mark, Matt, yeah. Yourself, what have you been up to this week? Or the last fortnight, sorry? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, as you know, the world has ended. The, the U.S. election has <laughs> taken place. We're all, we're all, uh, we're living in post-apocalyptic times or whatever they said it was going to happen. I don't know. It's 2020. Things have just gone. Oh, <laughs> I have to beep it out. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah, I'm doing alright. How about you? You doing okay? Yeah, yeah, really good. What, what um, have you been doing up on Linux? Days off. Um, I upgraded my uh, spare rig, which I use uh, for the podcast. I mean, it was previously an i5, uh, which had a measly four cores in it. Um, so I decided to um, upgrade it to the i7, which has got a well, double the capacity with eight cores. Um, so with the improved power, I've decided to change from Mint to KDE Neon. Mm. Um, I've, I've been quite impressed, actually, apart from today, but um, <laughs> that's probably my own making. I used to be obsessed with KDE because it was, you know, it's so customizable, so I could go through and tweak things oh. like every day, and it, it really yeah. fed my ADD. Um, but then I discovered Luna I Manager, did. so. <laughs> No, you could spend hours on it. Um, to be fair, I found a good widget because uh, I'm one for to-do lists and whatnot, whether I've tied it to my phone and my PC. But it's just a nice little widget that just sits on your PC, so there's no way I can ever escape it. Just um, edit it, strike it through, stuff like that. How about yourself? What, what have you? Oh, you've been having a few problems, haven't you? Yes. <laughs> um. All right. So I don't. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, like maybe on your first episode. I, I was talking about how I'd been doing Rofi scripts for the launcher, and I found an really cool one called Rofi Bluetooth that allows me to just hit a key binding, and it would bring up all my Bluetooth devices, and I could select it and it connect. Um, but that stopped working. I don't know. Like I had to go through. I mean, the key binding would still work, and I'd go through, and uh, it would um, it wouldn't connect, and I had to shut off Bluetooth, turn Bluetooth back on, reconnect. It was a pain in the ass. Uh, I really got to stop the swearing. I don't know what it was with me today. Um, no, nah, it's fine. Um, anyways, I um, so I just decided to use Bluetooth CTL, which is a command line, you know, command thing to connect things, and it's just, it's a pain. And I did a video on the on the YouTube channel like twenty years later, and audio problems are still a thing on Linux. I mean, all right, so it's like. You're building a car, Martin. You're a car mechanic. You're a, a custom car builder or whatever. There's there. Are, every car has to have certain things that will make it a car, like wheels and a oh, steering wheel and a gas pedal. I mean, <laughs> unless you're Fred, Fred, Fred Flintstone or something. I don't know. I mean, those are the things that you know a car has to have. And same thing with an operating system. There are certain things that have to just plain old work. One of those things, uh, you know is audio <laughs> and you know 20 or 30 years later audio problems still exist on linux i mean it's like it's the i mean it's one of the main things that has to work in it just i understand bluetooth is fairly new but it's not bluetooth isn't actually fairly new anymore it's been around for 15 years maybe longer yeah a, yeah i had a few problems with my bluetooth i just sort of just stick to the leads and it's definitely not pulse audio playing up Oh no, I don't. I think it's the fact that I'm using a window manager and it doesn't have a GUI uh, Bluetooth thing. I don't know. It's oh, it's just clashing heads somewhere in between. Well, then I have all I because I don't know what the difference between Pulse Audio and Alsa is. So they're I have them both installed. Um, because uh, I want the Pulse Audio, the Alsa uh, little widget for my Poly Bar, which is my static bar, bar along the bottom. You know, um, but Pulse Audio works better with you know connecting things. It's 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 a mess. I mean, it's just... Nah, you'll, you'll work it like, It makes me want to around. use Windows. No, don't. No. <laughs> you probably still have the same problem. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> All right. If you want to get in contact with us, you can do so at the Linux Cast on Twitter. You can also follow me on Twitter. I'm at MTWB. Martin is Martin Twit to you. I'll, the links to those will be in the show description. You can subscribe to all of our podcast feeds at the LinuxCast.org. Now, that just uh, redirects you to our Anchor page because we don't actually have a website because I'm much too lazy for that nonsense. 
Um, if you want to get in contact via email, they're old-fashioned way. You can do so at the linuxcast at gmail.com or follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash linuxcast. Also, make sure you subscribe on YouTube where you'll find awesome videos, including a video of the podcast. We call it a video. It's really just a you know an audio wave of, our, of us talking, but you also find tips, tricks, a whole bunch of other stuff on there as well. So we're going to move into our new section, and um, this week, Martin, why don't you go ahead and go first? Yeah, well, it was um, last week's news, really. It's, uh, the, I, was just, I brought it back up, to be fair, uh, just to see if you, you might dip your toe in to the new Raspberry Pi 400. It, Have you saw that Yeah, yet? the one with the, the keyboard, right? It comes in a keyboard. Yeah, old school. Yeah, it looks really cool. I'm not sure if I'd ever buy it, because I'm not sure what I'd use it for, but it looks cool. You know, I... If it had like an does it have an HDMI connector on it? Because yeah, if it does, yeah, it's... that's a, I might replace my my computer on my standing desk with it. That'd be really fun. And I'm oh. well, I, I was thinking the same because I mean I've I've got an old rig here uh, and one upstairs that I use for work. But I was just thinking, well, I could just use well, I've got poise to use, but this this has got a little bit more power behind it um, with some new um, chip architecture. Uh, but you've got two micro HDMI ports in it as well, so, uh, and they output 4K. Um, and I mean, the wattage that it'll kick out, I mean, next to nothing as compared to your power supply on your PC. Uh, and plus, with the added bonus, it's, it's you've got your keyboard there all the time. I mean, be interested as well, because I mean, a lot of people that like work in the IT industry and things like that are having to take their actual keyboard to work with them and things like that and sanitize the desks. But if it's a case that you could just buy a Raspberry Pi for, I think it was, let's see, um, I think it was, yeah, £95 as a kit. I think it's about $98 or something. There's not much of a difference. I mean, the kit's quite good. You've got a, a nice little Raspberry Pi booklet. You've got your mouse everything to get you up and running um you're not going to get cheaper than that unless you buy second hand uh, moving on to linux really so um i may well purchase one they're back in stock so yeah, yeah it, it does really look good um i don't see the hdmi connector though maybe i'm just missing it it's it's a micro hdmi oh. the, the really small one so you'll either have to buy an adapter or the um, normal size HDMI to the micro. You're better off just buying the um, adapter, to be fair. Yeah. Or two of them, obviously. But, I don't know. Yeah, but it, it looks awesome. Tempted with playing about it. Yeah, it looks really. I don't actually have any pies because I've never figured out a good use for one. Um, I will, See, there's your chance. Yeah, I, will, I also. Your standing desk. You know, yeah, I was thinking about you know by building a NAS, but it's just. I don't know. I'm just too lazy. I guess by, by the time I go through and buy, you know, the Raspberry Pi and then the, all the drives and stuff, I don't know. Anyways, uh, so, um, yeah, that's, I, that kind of, um, cause I don't think that was like any rumors of that 400 coming out. Like, no, um, I think everybody. the guys at, the guys at Ubuntu had it, uh, since September, I saw, um, on the interview. And they just couldn't say anything about it because they've got Groovy Gorilla working on it. I say working, um, I don't know whether it's a bit laggy, but with the added punch that this has got over the normal four, um, I'm, I'm hearing good reports of it. And at the end of the day, if it's just your your desk station or if you've got to um, connect to your server at work, you, you're going to use the server's power ne next to your own. But yeah, yeah it, it's a definite... It's, well, it's definitely going to be the Christmas um, hit in the com computing world, I'd oh, say. Cause, definitely. Well, apart from obviously Xboxes and <laughs> yeah, um, the four PS4s that are available. <laughs> yeah. So my uh, link for this week was the Pro One X smartphone. Um, now this thing looks like I don't know if you remember or if they had this over in the UK, Martin, but they had a, a, a the original Droid phone. Um, it was. Might have, it was made by Motorola, so it was probably branded something different, you know, in the rest of the world. But it was it was the original Droid phone here, and, and that had a slide out keyboard like this. And this looks this runs uh, 
Lineage, Lineage OS or Ubuntu Touch or Android. Um, and it looks really cool. Um, I'm not sure. I can't remember. This this link is like three weeks old now, but um, I'm not sure what it's. Oh, uh, $600. So, I mean, it's not even horrendously expensive. I mean, especially when you consider like an iPhone, it's like $1,000. So this one here will run multiple, you know, operating systems. It looks really cool. I'd love to try one out. I, I miss physical keyboards yeah. on, on um, yeah, phone. especially when you can tie it up to your monitor and get that external. I think that six fifty dollars is either the early bird price or the is it the XDA developers that's done it. I think when it retails, depending on how many they've got left, because I think it's just a case of it's it's an old phone previously they've just updated the specs. Mm. I think it's going to go and retail just well nine hundred dollars. Oh wow, yeah, that'd be too much. That'd be too expensive. Which is a bit pricey, but six fifty sounds okay, especially if it can replace um, yeah. your workstation and you just slip it in your pocket. But it does look really cool, and the hinge on it looks like it, it it's gonna last. And the, I saw a video on it with the, the developers, and uh, got a good love of Linux, and especially with Linux OS straight out the box, people want stuff like that. Yeah. So, so people just don't want to be messing about with a phone, installing things, and. But no, yeah, I, it, it does look good. But I think nine hundred dollars, p- people are just buy it. Yeah, no, I, I think Plus about or something like that. I mean, we could go on a rant about phone prices. Phones are just too expensive. Mm. I mean, it, the mainstream phones are just way too pricey. I mean, why would you spend a you know fifteen hundred dollars or two thousand dollars on a phone when you could buy a computer for that? <laughs> well, exactly. Like a high end computer too. I mean, it's not even like you end up with like a you could buy a gaming rig for two thousand uh, dollars and rant uh, this is going to be all about rants today it's, this is going to be so, um, <laughs> but nevertheless it, it looks a super cool phone it does it? look really nice and at least it's moving in the right direction maybe when they get a fair few sales off it uh, maybe a couple of the people say actually if we give people a choice <laughs> which is what people want yeah uh, we'll ship it with the ubuntu or lineage but then again the de- They'd have to get rid of some of the bloatware because, I mean, Samsung's renowned for it. If you buy one of their phones, yeah, yeah. days to get it off. Anyway, that's enough phones. <laughs> yeah, so um, if you want to get to the, the links of those topics, they will be in the show notes. And um, we'll move on to our main topic now, which is Linux permissions. Now, this is my topic. Um, and when I first selected this, I was having a hard time getting Jellyfin to work. And I gave up on Jellyfin. Um, <laughs> I, ga- I gave up on... Plex a long time ago, even though I did manage to get Plex up and running for a while, but that was when I was still distro hopping like every three weeks, and so I'd have to keep going through and setting up Plex server every three weeks, and it was just, oh man, it's a pain in the butt. Um, but that was, three weeks ago, I was still trying to get Jellyfin to work, and that's when we selected this topic, and it just reminded me, Martin, that Linux permissions are terrible. Um, I mean, if, if you, all right, so if you open up, uh, you know, a Windows machine, you boot into Windows, and you want to do something, you don't have to get into the terminal and type in chmod plus x or, you know, 755 or any of this nonsense in order to get it to work. You just use it. I mean, you might get yeah. this pop-up or whatever and says, are you, do you want to do this or whatever, but, I mean, you don't have to deal with links, you don't have to deal with permissions in Windows, that, that you know, to the point where you have to get into the terminal to do it. Um, and you do have to do that in, on Linux. It, we were talking the last time we were here about um, barriers to entrance for noobs, and this is one of them. Right? I mean, if, you, if you're a, a fairly technological, you can figure out how to install Linux fairly easily. But once you get to the point where you have to go through and change the permission on something and then risk not being able to access your data because you did it wrong, yeah. It, it, it just it's such a pain to have to go through and do it and it's just it's completely broken and i'm not i understand I mean, go ahead martin say what you're saying and say no no sorry i mean well i, was, well, I still do distro up now i just do it for through vms more than anything now um but what i did um because i always used to nuke and pave and part of the process i've always enjoyed stuff like that i don't know why um so I decided to create a script, right? So do this script, 
get all my programs on there or save type it out or go into websites do this script right copy it across to a usb right let's have a look let's bring the usb up you do not have permission to open this file and i'm like what why i've just literally typed it out and um, obviously must have been dead to the I didn't use the same name or, or stuff like that, but I just thought, how the hell? And I figured out after a while, I mean, I, I did it lazy. I, I used a GUI, went to permissions and changed it by there. And I thought, well, I suppose it is good in one sense from a security level, but it's stuff like that. It's like you say, it's a barrier because I just could not understand. Well, I'd copy it from there. Right, let's copy it again. And I, I just could not understand it. I obviously didn't realise how how detailed the, the, the permissions are. I mean, let's have a look at my uh, Linux pocket guide here. But um, yeah, with the LS minus L to bring up your permissions and stuff like that. And like you say, with the numbers and, and things like that, I mean, you could just scratch your head. I mean, I've gone through a couple of videos as I do and they start off fine <laughs> and then it, I just get a bit lost to be fair and I, I, I think I, I, if I do have to do it I probably would like you say the CH mod and things like that I probably would just do it the, the lazy way I mean it's not the way that you like because you, you like to be command line and, and, and doing it all in there but it's stuff like that is just hassle I mean thankfully I don't move a a lot of folders or f files about but there's obviously people the two have nazis and things like that that's got to get it all sorted mm. well, that's my thought on uh, my well, I mean, initial just, hurdle if you're just the one person using a computer it's hard right because you know, you're just moving computers around for yourself you have just the one username just the one group that you're you know mm -hmm. you're on but if you're trying to manage files for like on a NAS or on you know a server or something like that, and you have multiple groups and multiple users, it it gets. I understand that it. I understand the thought behind Linux permissions. It's supposed to be allow you yeah, to give yeah. this extra functionality over security for you know multiple people and all that, and it's a great idea. But when you're just a single user, you shouldn't have to have to deal with it for regular things like yeah if you're installing like a puck server or jellyfin i mean those are those are my examples because that's what i you know where i've had my biggest problems but if you know if you're doing those things the program itself should just change the permissions like it should pop up like it does i know comparing it to the great satan of, of windows but uh, you know, just pop up and say hey we need access to these files do you give us permission to do so type in your password yeah, yeah, you know that's how it should work instead of having to go yeah. well i can't jellyfin access my external hard drive oh i have to get in there and i have to give jellyfin permission i have to put jelly the jellyfin user which it creates upon install in the group of you know whatever and then i also have to change the permissions so that they have act read and wipe permissions to that folder but it, not that folder but the parent folder and maybe the parent parent folder and now all of a sudden Jellyfin has rewrite access to my entire external hard drive, including places like my tax documents and stuff. I mean, because of course it does, because apparently it needs it. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's the dumbest thing in the world because it's broken. It's just that is that that's not the way it should work. And um, it's just completely frustrating. I, I, I mean, I full-time Linux user here have been for three years I'm not gonna all of a sudden abandon Linux just because this is bad but this is broken and it needs to be fixed I'm not sure what the I mean the solution is just making a, a, an ability for programs to change the, per, the permissions that they, that they need um, you know whether that's a pop-up or whatever that I mean that's the solution but it's, I, I think that people have just gotten so used to having to deal with this nonsense that they've just it's just what it is um and on on another thought i mean why are there two ways to do it martin i mean i understand this is linux where every you know every there's 10 ways of doing everything um but why are there more than why is there this is I mean, it's like 
It's like with audio. <laughs> you don't want two or three ways of doing something because it just makes things confusing and makes it harder to actually work. Um, and there's at least two, probably three ways of changing permissions on Linux that I can think of. So you can do the, you know, RX, RWX, RWX, RWX thing, uh, you know, which is what you get when you do LS-L. Um, or yeah. you can go through and do the numbers thing, which is even more confusing because those letters add oh, up to numbers. Shit. Um, seven, five, five, six, five, five, six hundred, whatever. Um, I don't know what any of those numbers mean. Um, and nobody else does either. <laughs> I mean, by the way, um, that's what lost me. Right. And, and, you know, so there's two ways. And you, and if you have a GUI file manager, like Thunar or Nautilus or Dolphin or whatever, you can right click on it and change permissions from there. So that's three different ways of doing this. And none of them are good because half the time the, the, the GUI way doesn't work because it doesn't have permission to, to change um, things. So if you haven't ran your file your file manager as a you know as root, it doesn't have permissions to change most file you know you know yeah. permissions. So you can say you can go in there and change those permissions, and it will show that they were changed, but you didn't actually change them because it didn't have permission. <sighs> it's yeah, I've been there, been there. Um, I just had to move a, a file for a certificate over. And I was just scratching my head, and it well, I open up as root. Well, it, I should just be able to just drop in, and I, I'd found out because it was locked down. This uh, the file manager I was using at the time, so I, I forget whether it was naughty that, that I'd used just to enable me to copy from the di uh, directory I downloaded it to, um, and to another direction on my root folder. And I thought, well, with Windows, I mean it's just you just drag it across and, and drop it nice and easy. I mean I can understand yeah it's security. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't really be tatting about in the other folders and that. You've got your home folder, that's so your main one, but sometimes you do have to stray out. Um I mean I can understand all the security but maybe it'd be nice just to um when you're setting it up as you're going through your um setup, um is this gonna be a single user computer? Yes or no? Do you want to set up um, advanced file permissions, yes or no, and take it from mm -hmm. there? But obviously, it's one of the cases, if it's not broke, don't fix it for some people. But if it's just your average person that has got your NAS and things like that and quite comfortable in uh, the, the information's not going out anywhere. Uh, but yeah, I mean, to be fair, I, I haven't come across it that much, thankfully. Uh, but no doubt I will uh, to come. But I'll, I'll still use the, the right click and change your permissions. To be fair, it's just so, so much easier. Mm -hmm. um, just 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 for my laziness. To be fair, I mean, yeah, terminal's quite good. Get it, get in the command line, do a couple of bits and pieces like that. But if you deal with dealing with mass amounts of data and changing things over, unless you are um, quite Linux literate, um, it, it can be a pain in the butt. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I could see that now. I mean, yeah, security's fine, yeah, brilliant. Um, as opposed to uh, Windows, I mean, it, it literally is drag and drop, drop it on, get it sorted, they can read it. But there we go. It's there for a reason, that's all I can say on it. Yeah. <laughs> to test us. Yeah, it's just one of those... Uh, it's... It's for advanced users is, is what it is. It's exactly what it is. You're right. Mm. Um, mm. And, you know, that's fine because they consider all Linux users. Oh, damn it. <laughs> Keep hit my headphones on the yeah. microphone. Um, and, you know, they consider all Linux users admins because you have to be fairly advanced in order to you know, install it in the first place, I guess. Um, so they just assume that, you know, this is something new. And you're right that this isn't something that you see all the time. So it's not something that new users are probably going to even, I mean, if you're a new Linux user, chances are you're not even going to, you know, ever see Linux permissions. I mean, unless you're going to do something outside of the realm of normal, you know, like, yeah, you, you're probably going to be perfectly fine. But it's once you get more advanced and start managing servers or, you know, Raspberry Pis or, or you know, any file management really at all, it's good. That's going to be when you start having, you know, having issues. And that's, uh, um, I don't know. Anyways, so uh, let's uh, jump into our apps of the week. Martin, why don't you go first? Uh, 
my app rec recommendation um, is an app called Overgrive. Um, this is to um, upload, download um, from your Google account if anybody's got those. Um, I mean, I'd I subscribed. It, it was cheap at half the price. I think it's about forty-five um, quid for for the year, um, tied up to my family so we can share things. Um, now this app's you can use it for I think it's two weeks and just see how you get along with it. Um, obviously it syncs all your data. You could choose what to sync, what not to sync. Um, uh, back up your local drives, um, convert Google Docs to Office file formats uh, for offline editing, uh, backup only option if you want that, uh, and you can sync m multiple Gmail accounts. And I mean, I, I quite like this, and it I just feel that extra bit of security, especially if you're dropping photos onto your PC, you just don't know, and you can leave it running in the background. So, I mean, I, I dropped the guys, I think it was about five bucks, um, but yeah, I was quite happy with it. sits sits down, does exactly what it should do. Um, it's a lot easier than like the Dropbox ones. It, it, it just works. So that, that that's my recommendation. If anyone does use a, a Google Drive, have you had any problems with it deleting files? Because I've used some of those Google Drive things, the the more free versions, the you know, ones you don't have to pay for. And I had a problem where yeah. I went through and deleted like half the stuff on my drive. It was really annoying. No, they, these guys um, seem pretty stand up, to be fair. Um, like I say, you can test it out, but yeah, if you've had a, a bad one before. Um, but yeah, j just choose. I, I think it comes down to it's one thing I don't like. If, if, if you get the settings wrong and you delete from your computer and then it deletes it from your drive. You, you want to get your sync working right sometimes. Um, but, yeah, if you use your, your G drive, um, give, give it a quick try. See what you think of it. But, touch wood, I've not had any um, deleted data. He, he said he's... All right, so mine is um, a little terminal application, of course, because, you know, nerd here, <laughs> uh, called yeah. WPM. I've left the link in the show description. The links for both of these will be in the show description, um, the show notes. Um, and this is called it's called WPM, and basically, if you're uh, if you're in interested in learning or either learning how to type or learning how to type faster, um, this is basically just a typing test in the terminal, um, and it's um, it's fairly simple. It's got about 1,500 quotes or whatever that you can just go through, and it will you you type the stuff and it shows you how fast you were. Um, it's very simple. Um, it has a few options like you can keep track of your stats and stuff, um, but uh, you know it's not anything overly complicated it's just a few hundred lines of code um and i mean it doesn't really have any over advantage you know like huge advantages over doing like, like on a website or something but it, this gives you control yeah. over your own statistics and stuff um and uh like it, you know, i've been trying to go through and practice my typing every single day for about uh, about three months now and i've gotten faster um, I, i've always been fairly yeah. fast I and mean, i can get up to like you know, 80 words a minute, but I've been trying to break the 100 word a minute um, barrier. I'm not quite there yet. I'm not as accurate at those speeds as I, you know, at the lower ones. Um, but anyways, this is just means I can keep this open in a terminal or whatever in one of my tabs and work on it every day. So that's mine. And just to give give 10, 15 minutes to it. Uh, just to check, um, it's got like terminal commands in there. and that's uber boring, but it's, it's, or is it just like the quick fox type stuff oh no it has, it has um is it just like words it, just it's like quotes from books and um like you know, oh, right. you know like shakespeare and um, pr probably mostly public domain works is is what i've been finding so far i haven't gone through all gotten through all of the quotes but um um it's not i think because you can go through and add like say you had a you found a repository of quotes online or whatever you can go through and add your own quotes to this too um so that you can control length and stuff like that, and it's just in a little. I think it's a like a CSV file where the quotes are located. Oh right. So it's not even. So you could. Yeah, it's not even that hard to um, you know, set up or alter or anything. It's just really a, a really small program. Oh, so you could set it up with your own terminal commands. Mm -hmm. And um, just 
practice those, so to speak. Yeah, it's, oh, that sounds a good little app, actually. Yeah, it's, uh, I was uh, well, not app, but yeah. It, it surprised me that there, it even kind of existed because I, mean, I mean, usually when you think when you you know practice typing or whatever, you just go to a you know Mavis Beacon or whatever it is yeah. uh, <laughs> on uh, on the you know on the internet. And, but this is just something that you can store locally, and you don't have to worry about you know having to sign in with your um, Google account, your Facebook account, in order to, you know, sure. uh, keep track of your stats. Anyways, um, that is it for us this time. Um, I'm not sure. Our next one is uh, season four, episode fourteen, dual booting. So we're going to be talking about uh, the merits of dual booting, I guess, and uh, whether or not we should still do it. I think that, uh, this is Martin's topic, so we should that should be really fun. Should you use Windows? Sure. I don't think you should use Windows. I think that's just stupid. <laughs> Hey, hey. <laughs> Anyways, um, two Linux partitions. That's what you need. Two Linux partitions. Anyways, all the contact information is there at the top. Uh, remember to subscribe on YouTube for um, many awesome videos every week. And we'll uh, see you next time. Great stuff. Catch you next week, guys. Cheers. Yeah.